really impacted us as a country and globally in the most devastating way that we never expected. Many of us had to change our lives, had to change the way we do things. And most importantly, those who are doing business had to think about their business strategies and how they keep on surviving under the storm. We do note though that while the storm is still raging in our country, many globally give hope because we are seeing them coming out of the storm and starting to see activities within the tourism industry coming to life. We will not want to miss an opportunity when that opportunity comes or the time comes for us as a country to reignite our ways and actually get our tourism sector to thrive beyond what we, where we were. So we need to remind ourselves of what is important for South Africa. We need to remember that our vision and our motto has always been about protecting our places. These are the beautiful attractions that we have across the country. Whether you go to which province, you find either the mountains that gives you a beautiful scenery, or even when you are an virtuous person, you are able to have your adrenaline, adrenaline drives. But those who love romance are able to still have beautiful memories that are created within families, within partners and friends. Until then, we need to stay safe, do what our government has called upon. But we do believe that as the world will start opening, we shall be touring again, we shall welcome millions of people to our shores and show them the nature of our people in terms of being able to take care of them, looking after them because the most asset we have as a country, it's you South Africans who are able to make a visitor feel at home. And we are definitely at that time, we'll be opening our shores to say, please take care of our visitors, please take care of our tourists and make them feel at home as we know you always do. COVID-19 has had a huge impact, actually devastating impact on the tourism sector. Um, when many countries started to see incidences or even cases of the pandemic in their own countries, um, they, in order to contain um, the pandemic, closed borders, restricted movement. In our case as South Africa, when the first national disaster, um, when the president announced the national disaster, and also announced lockdown. We saw complete tourism activities coming to a standstill. Literally nothing was moving. Um, this we mean flights, accommodation, every, all attractions were closed. So as we know that South Africa adopted the risk adjusted uh, um, strategy, where we talk about levels. So level five, level four, you saw nothing happening in the country in terms of tourism except we started seeing some level of activity in the accommodation, but specifically it was for, for quarantine. So nothing, restaurants were closed, 100%. Um, attractions where people are able to take people on tours and everything closed. Um, flights grounded only for repatriation, taking out and bringing um, citizens. So if you look at the value chain of tourism, literally, both direct and indirect activities grounded um, to a halt. That went on for a couple of months until we went to almost level four, because when we had level four um, ad adjusted, I can say, because at the beginning of level four, we didn't have much of that as well. So we could see some level of activities, but it was just not even making a dent. For example, when the announcement of restaurants to open only for delivery, many of the restaurants in our country couldn't because the business models were not designed for such. So they're not able to open. And they took option to say, we're not going to open. Um, we moved to level three initially as well, was collection and delivery for those who are designed for restaurants in terms of sitting down, ordering you, for example, your steak. We're not able to operate until we could open 
for sit down. So it tells you the impact of COVID. I'm just making an example with things that we know, we see. Many of us, for example, in Gauteng, you know that people could visit Maroping as an at, at, attraction. That activity, its restaurants, people who work there were affected because totally closed. Now, many of the businesses, because they were not generating an income and were not working, were not even able to pay the, the salaries of their employees. So this then had an impact on the workers. Some were able to say, okay, we'll not lay you off, but we are going to tap into government's resources so that you get paid through UIF. And therefore we can, some actually negotiated for 50% pay, but some just realized that with no income, I can't guarantee any contribution to the workers and they closed and retrenched. So the impact is devastating. And we talk about this quite often. Several times I've been in public domain to say, when we started, when we were at level four, we did an analysis of the impact on jobs. We could see by September, if no activities was coming to, to life, that we were going to lose between 500,000 and 600,000 jobs in the tourism sector specifically. Now the number is reduced because when we moved to level three, we started seeing quite a number of activities coming in, accommodation, restaurants, and we are seeing still almost about 300,000. Um, we are doing a reworking based on the recently announced to see if we have been able to save quite a number of jobs. We do know areas where because tourists are not coming, let me say in terms of accommodation, many people would know they are um, let's say in Kruger National Park, within Sabi Sabi. The prices are high, and normally that area has been the preserve for international tourists. With the border still closed, it means they will not be able to attract anyone into them unless they do a rework of their model. Change the pricing, reduce it, change uh, the way they are offering. It's a lot of money because it means as a business, you must rework your business model. You must rework your projection. I guess everybody had to work, rework their projections. But the implication thereof is that either the business is going to, as they rework, then they reduce the stuff. So it's always an interlink between as the business change, models changes, as the business are trying to survive, the impact will be on the workers themselves. So from where we are sitting, the impact as well, we know that as we sit, 30% of the restaurants are gone already. This means there are certain restaurants that you would have known before COVID-19. You are going to go into a mall, look for them, you will not find them because they are no longer existing. This is the 30% that we are. And we talk about especially those who are SMEs are highly affected because they do not have a caution for them to survive. Big business can still survive with their reserves, they have credit facility that they can go over drafts and all that. For a small business, what comes in, it's what runs their business. Three months without an, an income, then the business is finished. So that's how, in a nutshell, I can go on in terms of explaining in detail the impact of COVID-19 in terms of the tourism sector. If there's any sector that has been highly or hugely affected, is this sector. I don't think there's any sector that is suffered like tourism. In terms of short-term impact and um, interventions, we, we've had one, I would want to put it as government's intervention globally for us. Um, when I say globally, I mean within the country, all the interventions, and also specifically for the department. The first one is around what I spoke about earlier when I spoke about the impact on the jobs is the what we call TES, the UIF. Government made available to say employers should not fire employees. While they are not able to pay salaries, therefore, what we'll do will give a level of what is called UIF income for the workers. So for three months first, they were given. It was extended um, until 15th of August. And this is under uh, Minister Nguessi, Department of Employment and Labor. Now, with that for tourism, it was a huge relief because you could see that quite a number of our sector were able to benefit. And what we did to fast track and make sure that people don't lose out, don't know where to go and all that, 
we made an arrangement, we went and negotiated with Department of Labor and Employment to say assist us in making TBCSA, Tourism Business Council of South Africa, as a platform for application. So the sector, because they know TBCSA, would work through TBCSA to access UIF. So they became like a platform where they are able to even track um, the applications and give feedback as part of making sure it's easier to, to process for the sector. The second one then became what we did as the department, which is um, 200 million set aside for tourism relief scheme. With that, we said we would be able to support 4,000 companies across the country, across subsectors. Um, and this, they will get a 50,000 each a grant. This they don't have to pay back. So this was given, we afforded them. Unfortunately, I mean, in terms of that as well, we had many people who applied. Uh, the application were more than 7,000 and we could only get give to 4,000. So you can imagine more than 3,000 still outstanding who applied literally. Now that's another it tells you because we just had that amount. Then the other one is around um, the 200 billion um, credit facility that was made available by Minister Mboweni together with uh, the banks and, and the Reserve Bank. Uh, that as well is available for the tourism sector. The last one as well is for tourism guide guides. Because we noted much part, tourism guides us to explain, many of them are registered under the Tourism Act. So others are not in business, so they have not registered companies. So they will not fall in the tourism relief fund. So they couldn't apply. They were kicked out because they are not registered. You needed to have a company registered. Now, with the facility in terms of UIF, you needed to be an employee to access uh, UIF. Now, this one's because they are freelance, did not have qualifying for both sides. And realizing that because they are within our portfolio and they're registered in the department under our registrars, we felt the obligation that we needed to provide some level of support. So what we did, we set aside 30 million for them. This would be income for about three months. Um, they will receive it uh, to assist them to go by, but also we believe that as we open, they will be able to buy things such as masks, your sanitizer, so that they can conduct their businesses safely, noting that for the past months, they've not had a single income. So we've been able, to, it will be an, an income, it's not much. We estimating it should be about 1.5 for three months, each tourist guide. That's the support. So those are the interventions that we've made to try and cushion uh, in terms of our sectors, but as government broadly. And we do note, I always have to say, because of the fiscal constraint, we know the demand is higher than what we have available. And that's why one of the reasons we had to start working on reopening the sector so that the sector can be self-sustainable, can start generating income so that they don't become dependent on the state in terms of relief. We have now opened uh, for tourist, tourist guides to, far, to start working. So with this three months, it's also to say as business picks up. So it will help them between now and as business picks up. So starting with, uh, we started paying last week, which is end of July. So it will be end of July, August and September. And our belief is that by that time, we should have quite significant activities in the tourism site so that they can start generating income. So this, as I say, it's for them to be able to start having some level of assistance to get back to work. And that's how they should see it. Would want them to start generating their own income because I don't think we'll be able to afford from our budget any more relief beyond that. I think for tourism specifically, I think there's quite a lot of work that is being done in terms of women. Um, I'll come to that. And, but I do believe that we still fall short in terms of young people. And this is one of the priority areas that I would want to take going forward. And even looking at institutionalization of the work in terms of support for 
for young people in the sector um, in business. So we do quite a lot in terms of young people in training um, because we do training for chefs, training for sommeliers. This is wine appreciation. We've got hospitality training. So in terms of skills development, there's quite a huge opportunity. We've been doing very well. But for young people who are in business in the tourism sector, I don't think we've had quite focused area to say this is specifically intervention for young people. And this is one of my priority uh, as I got into the portfolio to say I want to see quite a lot of work being done. But not only that, even within the department, institutionalize that. Have a focus area or people that I can assign as the minister to look at this area so that it can grow. So it's work in progress. It's part of my vision. With women um, within the tourism sector, we've got what we call women in tourism. We do have a team that looks after that. Part of the issue, we've had quite several meetings with them. They've launched themselves in terms of chapters in, in, in provinces. These are women who are in business in the tourism sector. So we're providing quite a lot of support for them to be trained, for them to get into sessions where it's information sharing sessions. So there's quite a lot of work that is being done. But there have been quite of many of them being beneficiaries of the department's program in terms of market access, um, in terms of uh, products, their products being uh, showcased marketing when we go abroad. And also one of the issues that, or one of the programs that we've done is around women leadership program. Uh, this is a, a, a developmental program that we do with um, UNISA. Uh, it's leadership development because we take women who are in the tourism sector in terms of employment, for example, either you can say middle management um, in a hotel, put them in the program, develop them, and we've seen quite a number of them rising to being CEOs or even being re responsible. There's one lady we'll have to do follow-up who was placed in Dubai as a, as a manager. So you'd see progress in that because you are taking them from a bit lower and moving them, supporting them above. But when you look in terms of our transformational report, you do see that quite a lot of women are participants in the sector. But when you move in terms of management and ownership, we're still lacking. So that as well is something that we have to continuously pay attention, but we can't do alone as the department. We do need the sector to play ball. Um, we do need everybody to come on board to support the initiatives, to support the work. I think across the country, um, two weeks ago, there was a report that was released in terms of women leadership, uh, whether you check in terms of GSC uh, companies, you do find that there is a challenge um, in terms of our work around that. So it's also work in progress. Um, I note that we are in Women's Month. Uh, part of the issue, and when I issued my statement last week, was to say we have to be conscious, we have to do it, whatever it takes to drive the involvement of women in terms of the sector. And as a woman leader, I think I have that obligation and I carry that responsibility on my shoulder. The lockdown regulations have, um, and, and all of us in cabinet in working, have a difficult task managing lives and livelihoods. So it's a balance. Um, the restaurant colleagues um, did give us feedback to say they would want to see alcohol safe because they are not able to make enough income in terms of just opening for sit down to eat. Now, we did get that feedback. We took it back to our um, National Coronavirus Command Council together with cabinet. So it was processed properly. What, maybe taking a step back to explain the process on how decisions are taken. So we have, for example, the Department of Tourism will put together proposals to say this is what we want to see as activities coming live from tourism. That proposal will go to a technical team that is called NetJoint. 
um, it's got all the others. It has sub what we call work streams. So you'll have the health work stream, the legal work stream, um, the security work stream, the economic work stream. They will receive those reports, process them. All of them, the technical teams will make inputs. And those inputs is what comes to NCCC as recommendations. And out of NCCC, then it will be looked at, a recommendation then goes to cabinet as for adoption and opening. And then out of that, then the regulations will be done by an IMC, Interministerial Committee, chaired by Minister Lamini Zuma. I'm part of it. Look at the regulations, put together the regulation. Out of those regulations, then she will announce the regulation together with Minister Patel, uh, Minister Lamola. From there, then there will be line ministries dealing with their issues like in tourism then the minister of tourism so i'm explaining that so that people must understand the importance and how things are really processed thoroughly so we did pro propose that the restaurants um, are requesting to sell alcohol there were quite a number of proposals including as far as saying patrons will not be um, restaurants will not sell more than two glasses or two bottles of beers you know trying to put certain mechanism so we did send that as proposals to, to the process. Um, as we did that, the health team, together with the security team, brought in their presentation regarding alcohol. From the security cluster point of view, they were able to show that during lockdown, the initial phase of lockdown, how much crime had gone down in terms of accidents, in terms of people fighting, stepping each other, killing each other. And then they showed when we opened for alcohol, how the number has gone up. And then they showed even now, as we reintroduced, how it was going down. Similarly with the health team, showed in terms of trauma units in the hospitals, that during hardcore level um, lockdown, level five, level four, where alcohol was not sold, they could show us, in terms of the graphs and the amount, the numbers, how the incidents in trauma units went down. These are incidents as well out of stabbing, fighting, car accidents, they were showing. And then they showed as we opened. So you could clearly see the numbers fluctuation. Now, I always say, as much as I love my sector, as a reasonable human being, there's no way you can counter that. There's clear evidence of this, and that's how we lost the debate on that. Now, it's logic, and the, the, both the teams from health and from security are saying, we need the workforce, these people who are in the front line of battling with COVID, at least to have their attention focused on fighting COVID rather than being diverted by things that can be avoided. So this is the message I took last week when I spoke to my sector.